Welcome to the uh, November 2014 Sustainable Energy Sustainable Homes Seminar Series. My name is Chris Wilson. I'm the Program Manager at the U.S. Green Building Council, Idaho Chapter. Uh, tonight's topic is Energy Efficient Components. Uh, we'll touch on HVAC systems, appliances, lighting, uh, the things that heat and cool and light your home and uh, consume energy, and uh, developments that uh, have come about in new technology and building techniques to make them more energy efficient uh, while keeping your home comfortable and um, convenient. So uh, I'd like to introduce our sponsors for this series. Um, Green Remodeling is our title sponsor. Um, they've been involved since the beginning of the Sustainable Energy, Sustainable Home series. Uh, Johnson Brothers Windows and Doors, Osprey Building Performance, Avant Properties, Franklin Building Supply, uh, the Integrated Design Lab, Boise Weekly, Flying Cowboys Design Build, a1 Heating and Cooling, Earthcraft Construction, Gravitas Design, Solar Cascade, Building Energy, Idaho Power, and Renewable Energy Solutions. Uh, without their support, we wouldn't have a show and wouldn't be able to bring this information to um, people of Idaho and anybody else there on the Internet that has found us on YouTube. So we appreciate our sponsors and we appreciate you all tuning in. Um, Without further ado, we'll move into our content tonight, and we'll start out with Steve Howe with Renewable Energy Solutions. He's going to give us an overview of um, residential home energy use and um, energy efficient lighting. And um, just an FYI, we had a little bit of technical difficulty tonight due to the snowstorm, so um, this intro is a post script. This is actually after the show, but uh, we didn't get our, our introduction recorded. So here we go to the live content. Thanks very much. So questions are, are okay anytime. This is supposed to be an interactive thing, particularly to get to the LED lighting, because we were actually going to have a specialist come in and talk about LED lighting, and I am anything but a specialist in LED lighting. So I will show you a few slides, but unfortunately the other, the other folks weren't able to come, so I'm filling in on LED and lighting efficiency. Okay, so uh, this jumble is electrical energy usage over a period of time. and. Uh, uh, you see these are the months along the bottom, and this is kilowatt hours per day uh, along the top axis. And look at this blue line here. That's when, that's when we started uh, doing this. Now, um, I had a college student at home. Well, I had a high school student at home, and that high school student went away. And so one of the first recommendations I would make in order to improve the energy efficiency is to get rid of your kids. Um, you know, send them off to college, and then that that drops, uh, you know, considerably. So that's kind of that's a little bit of a cheat. Um, but then somewhere along in here, and and I, I made a sort of a critical error. I never wrote down, and so if I was going to do, I would write down what I made when I made what change. I was just completely haphazard about it. Okay, so you you see here though, there begins to be a band here like this. This is the summer air conditioning load, pretty good size peak. Um, these peaks are the blower and uh, lots of use of lights in the winter time. Um, so you can see here that there's a, a fairly, fairly systematic uh, pattern showing up. Now, if you uh, calculate, if you looked at uh, energy use, here was the here was the target line. This was the 10% per year reduction, and this is the actual reduction in energy usage coming down here. And this was what I thought I could support with a 10 kW photovoltaic system. So the idea is reduce, 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 and then put in PP. Okay. So in here, I had trouble. Well, I had trouble both with the air conditioning and also had trouble uh, in the winter time with uh, the furnace. And so I switched over to uh, space heaters for about a month. And you can see the blip in the electrical power. Uh, when I did that, so, but it, it's coming down, coming down as much as I really need it to come down all the way. I need to make another incremental improvement, and here's where the topics today fit in because energy efficiency is appliances, energy efficiency in lighting, energy efficiency in uh, in the HVAC system, uh, plus uh, any kind of insulation I could use will help me get in line. Yeah. I have a gas-fired uh, furnace years old. Carrier Weathermaster 800, I think is what it is. 
Okay, so where do we go? Internet, and that, that basically says is a diffuse kind of problem. It, okay, thing almost almost always turns out to be the biggest energy use, certainly in our climate. Cooling can be pretty big in our climate, uh, and depends upon the summer. Water heating, that stands out pretty high. The appliances, which we'll talk about today. The water heating we'll talk about in the, in the solar hot water class. In this one, uh, we've got uh, um, the appliances, we've got lighting, and uh, HVAC guys can talk about this from the point of view of the equipment itself, not from the point of view of the envelope. So how much electricity do appliances use? And again, this is just a chart off the internet, looking for nice graphics. Um, and again, it really has the same message. The use of electricity is very diffuse. There's all kinds of things we use electricity for. Um, if you do have an electric water heater, that's a huge hitter. Um, if not, that shows up on the natural gas chart as, as a pretty good hitter, you know, uh, 10, 15 percent of your annual energy use is in heating water. And that's why the first thing I did um, was to put in solar hot water. That was the first renewable energy thing that, uh, that I ended up using because that was, you know, that was something I knew how to do. Um, so clothes dryer is pretty big, pool pump, I don't have to worry about that, I don't have a pool, a uh, refrigerator, freezer. Then the rest of it is, is, you know, is spread out over, this, make, this is a Pareto or a listing of things and you get this long tail and it makes it tough because you know, it's a diffuse problem. Uh, there's lots and lots of different things. Okay, so uh, the next thing is, um, that came along during this time is Idaho Power. Idaho Power has got something, got something called Account Manager, and that's very useful in the measuring process. You can go in and sign on to Account Manager. You may have to set up an account, but it gives you graphs like this. You can know every hour of a day what your energy usage to reduce energy, you can know in detail what your electrical energy is. You know, it'll identify problems. And if you're gone you know, and you're using massive amounts of energy, then you were gone for three days and you go, well, what, what's going on? And then you realize that, you know, you got five lights on in your basement and you never turned them off or whatever. Okay. Natural gas usage. I didn't do as good a job keeping up to date on this. Um, and you see very low usage in the summer. This is just cooking and what's left after uh, doing um, uh, what's left as backup for uh, the solar hot water heater. Um, so very, very low gas use in the summertime. And then as one expect, the, the fall and the winter is high gas usage. Now here's the chart I'm trying to reduce then my natural gas usage. Well, you see, that's that's a failure. I mean, that's just abysmal. That's just nothing. <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> that's reducing natural gas use. Okay, so these two data points are summed up because I lost the ability to go look at the record. But this one's real, and this one's real. Uh, this one, I suspect, but don't know for sure, that maybe my furnace wasn't working very well. It was on and off, and I eventually had to have it repaired. Okay, this is what Intermountain gives you um, as, a, as a record, uh, and that's kind of useful, except as big some they, they show zero, and sometimes they charge you the, the two months. And so you got, a, well, you got two months with the data compared to nothing the, the month before. Here again, you see it here and here. But it gives you year-over-year -year comparison. And then there's an interesting little tidbit on this thing. You look down here and you see the yellow bars are bigger than the blue bars. And they're bigger by about double. I mean, they're not, they're not big. I mean, they're, you know, low usages. So this year, I have a natural gas fireplace. And last year, I turned off the pilot light. So instead of the pilot light being on all summer, I turned it off and that's different. And, you know, Without the pilot light on, the pilot light's sitting there burning all summer long. Um, and it's also running the air conditioning because the heat from the pilot light's got to get rejected, so it's a twofer. Um, 
Okay, so here's the CO2 metric. This is a combination of both the natural gas use and the um, electrical use. And here's the CO2 production. <laughs> to follow this CO2 reduction curve all the way down here, you see I'm not doing as badly. I'd be doing better if it was just electricity. And of course I'm doing worse because of the natural gas. But because natural gas doesn't produce as much CO2 as electricity, then it's it's obviated. But I can you know, I call. Okay, energy efficient lighting. So now we're switching into the second second topic. All that this lighting, we got to reduce some chances. energy ways uh, some point of view the, the place that I'm driving to is is getting down low enough so that photovoltaics can take you know the remainder uh, and that may not be possible but that's the idea okay energy efficient lighting the first thing that I did is I went around and counted how many light bulbs I had I had 44 light bulbs I had just a hell of a lot of light bulbs and a lot of them were the can lights that were in the ceiling. And uh, and for a long time, I thought the can lights had holes in them and I was going to lose all the air, you know, hot air in through the cans and can lights. Turned out they were sealed can lights, which was great. That was a that was a wonderful revelation. Probably weren't insulated very well, but at least they were sealed. So, you know, take apart the can light and look and see if there's a bunch of holes in the can light, because that's just like holes where the hot air goes through. Um, and in my case, the house was recently recent enough so it was can light the seal. So this stuff is really just common sense. Use natural lighting every chance you get. Um, and the from my particular house, I've got big north windows, which are terrible for energy use, but they allow a lot of natural light in. So I can turn all the lights off. Turn the lights off. I mean, that just seems so obvious. The cheapest thing you can do is go around and turn the lights off. I know you feel like a <laughs> you feel like an old guy going around and turn the lights off, but I mean it's just dead simple, you know. You just go around and turn the lights off. It's just so cheap. Replace all the incandescent lights with either CFL or LED, and we'll talk about that. Is, is, is that behind Amy? That's behind Amy. Yeah, okay. and there's a story there. There's a story when we get there. A... So replace all the incandescent. Install motion detector or timer switches on the lights to get left on. Uh, and the first one I installed here was in the garage, and it really, what would happen, what he's referring to, is that uh, Amy goes to work early, okay, and she goes to the garage, turns the lights on, gets in the car, and drives away. And I get up later, and about 10 or 11 o'clock, I realize, oh, I didn't really turn the lights off. So I go out in the garage, and I've got like four big lights in the garage. I go turn the lights off. So I thought, oh, okay, I got a solution for this. I'll put a motion detector on. And so she walks in, the lights come on, gets in the car, she goes away, and everything is cool, you know? And the lights come on, she comes home, and, you know, success. Until I've got the garage door open, and I'm playing with my dog, and the motion detector goes on. <laughs> and so if the garage door is open during the summertime, the motion detector is on, and so all the lights are on. <laughs> so now you win some, you lose some. Uh, so switch to LED bulbs on the lights you use the most. The LED bulbs are expensive, but you, you can go around and say, well, which ones do I use all the time? And you put LEDs in those, because, you know, the, a light in a closet that you only turn on once every, you know, month or something, you know, that it doesn't matter, because you never turn it on. But the ones you use all the time, that's where the LEDs should go. Uh, use candles for entertaining. Uh, here's another interesting story. Um, so our house has a slanted dining room. Okay, and when we first bought the house, we went and we said, hey, there's no light in the dining room. And then we realized that there was supposed to be a chandelier there and that they were leaving it to the new owner to pick out the chandelier. Well, we never bought a chandelier. We just never did. And so we had various lights and stuff like that. And so we had some kids come over, um, and I thought, well, we're going to have light in this room. How are we going to put the lights in the room? And I thought, well, maybe it's time to buy a chandelier two LED bulbs and a chandelier. Then I thought, no, I got candles. I got candles left over from Christmas. I just put the candles on the table. I don't use this room very often. 
And candles for a dining room, that's kind of okay. And it didn't cost me anything. And uh, I like that solution better. So, uh, anyway, so that's what use candles. Use light wisely. Um, these guys at the Integrated Design Lab are, are all about that. You know, uh, a lot of talk about using light only for the tasks that you have at hand. You know, trying to hold. And I kind of wish we had somebody who was really good at that because uh, I'm not. I just know the concept of, you know, use, use lights for the task at hand. Don't try to light the entire environment. Light, light where you need to have light, not for the entire room. And then measure results. Okay, so these next two slides uh, are a comparison between CFL and LED bulbs. And I don't think I'm going to go through the whole thing. I did this in the economics of sustainable energy in, in, uh, in September. But the basic idea is that there's a first cost and a variable cost. Um, the first cost is the cost of the bulb. And the variable cost is the cost of, of electricity. And light bulbs are a good example where the first cost is low and the variable cost, in terms of energy per year, is in the first year the same as the first cost. So over the life of the product, the first cost is small compared to the running cost. And that's true, it's really true of incandescent lamps, because incandescent lamps are really inexpensive at first, and they take a lot of energy to use over a period of time. So you've got this first cost, of a of a buck fifty nine, and you've got this running cost of a duck a buck forty two, and so the first year cost is sort of equally split between the first cost and the running cost, and over the ten years, you're beginning to have to replace a few of the bulbs, but still the majority of the cost, the vast majority of the cost, is the cost of electricity. It's not the cost of the bulb. Okay, so LED on its head. Turn, turns that idea around. An LED, so oh, the other cost is you gotta replace the thing. So there's, you know, you gotta get up on a ladder and replace the thing, or you gotta go to the store and buy the bulb, or, you know, you got this cost associated with having the overhead of it. There's a maintenance cost that's not captured in these numbers. There's a sort of half cost. Okay, so the energy, whoops. The consumption of a 60 watt incandescent lamp is cut to 13 watts by the CFL. So huge reductions in the amount of energy going from 60 to 13. And a lot of the energy reduction you saw in my house was this trans transition between incandescents and CFLs. Okay. Now the next transition from CFLs going from 13 watts to 10.5 watts is anywhere near as big. It's percentage terms, it's, you know, 20, 25 percent, about 20 percent. But, you know, it's, you're chipping away at, at, at less amount of total energy consumption. Okay, now 13 watts, and we got 10.5 watts. But, hey, a reduction is a reduction, and arguably it's perhaps less expensive to do it this way than it is to invest in PV panels. And you go out and buy a bulb, where a PV system is a big capital expense. It's a big, you know, it's a big production. It's not a big production to buy an LED light bulb. So you can attack problems on the margin with LED bulbs that are too big a hurdle for photovoltaic panels. Okay. So these things are supposed to have tremendous life. And well, we'll see how long the life are. Uh, cost of energy is down. Here the annual cost of energy is down. First year cost is big, and so it takes a while to pay off that first cost. This is 10 bucks, um, but as you'll see later, those costs of LEDs, they were 40 bucks a few years ago. 10, they're gonna go to five. These are gonna merge uh, lower and lower costs. Okay, so a couple of uh, projections I found from the U.S. Energy Information Administration. And it, it, it's important, it has two factors that are important with LEDs. 
LEDs aren't done technically, and they aren't done in terms of their cost curves. So here is the efficiency projections for LED lights. So for down here, they're projecting through advances in the technology of LEDs to continue to get more and more efficient. So that's the first vector of LEDs. Um, the second vector of LEDs is that, oh, here's the CFL. So no real change in the CFL. And here's the incandescent. Incandescents aren't going to get any better. CFLs aren't going to get any better. But LEDs are going to get better and better and better in terms of their energy efficiency. The second is cost. And you look at this cost curve, and it's just dropping like a rock. Now, it's going to flatten out here, but it's still dropping considerably. Here's about 10 bucks. Uh, I think they use 60 watts as a, uh, you know, the, the 800 lumen light bulb as a standard. That, anyway, that that's about what it is today for, a, for an 800 lumen, which is a 60 watt equivalent bulb. It's about $10. You can get them a little cheaper. So, irony. Why would you go out and buy LEDs now if they're going to be cheaper later? You know? And so that's that's the same sort of irony there is with photovoltaics. It's like you keep putting off the prices because you say, oh, well, it's dropping. The price is dropping and they're getting better. And, well, the answer to that for me is back to this slide. Uh, switch on the ones you use the most. And then as they come down in price, begin to replace the rest of them. So that gives you a, an incremental way of just kind of easing into it. So you get the advantage now. You get some of the advantage for the ones that you use the most. And then as they come down, you replace the ones that are less. I mean, most people replace light bulbs when they're out, right? Uh, and it is kind of hard to take good functioning working light bulbs and put them in a corner and put them in a plastic bag and go take them somewhere. That's a little hard. Okay, so uh, the only thing I have more about LEDs is a lot of references that I didn't really dig into all that much, but I found a heck of a lot of them. So if you go on the web and put in LED bulbs, um, there's Energy Star, which has got which rate LED bulbs. That's interesting detail. There's all kinds of government stuff about LED bulbs. Uh, so and go ahead and knock yourself out. Learn everything there is to know about LEDs, but in 36 hours. That. Okay, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Me next, the next speaker. Steve, can I ask a follow-up yep. question? Do you know yep. if they make LED bulbs uh, for dimmer light switches? I think they do. I think I saw that at Costco. I think I saw it. surprised me uh, that I, there was LED dim, dimmable LEDs. I think the answer is yes. Did you see them too, Berman? Okay. okay. Uh, great. And also on those websites you mentioned, um, could you kind of locally say those because they're a little difficult to read? Yes. The video? Okay. All right. Okay. I found a website called Earth Easy, and they had a lot of information about LED bulbs <laughs> and, uh, and, and comparisons of LED bulbs, charts and graphs and all kinds of good stuff. Um, the EPA Climate Change website. Uh, is also the EPA uh, is, is a good is a good source. Uh, the government uh, Energy Star website that's www.energystar.gov. Uh, they have good information on LED lights. Um, there's uh, another energy.gov uh, slash energy saver, um, and uh, uh, this one was uh, estimating appliance and at home electronic energy use. And then the good old Home Depot had stuff uh, on it. Um, and so, you know, all kinds of sources. You don't have to put very much in there. You put in LED bulbs, and a bunch of stuff comes up. Just start, just start looking. The uh, Energy Information Agency, U.S. Energy Information Agency is also a good source. I didn't list that here. It's on one of the slides. And uh, also uh, uh, U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, has got some good uh, good stuff. It's some subset of the Department of Energy. Uh, 
Okay, next up is Lyndall Klein. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk about efficient appliances. But first off, my name is Lindell Klein. I work at CHF Home Furnishings. By profession, I'm actually a kitchen designer, but with the recession, you know, I found a place at, at CHF. Um, so, and before we get started, I would like to thank Abby because I'm from the era of overhead projectors, <laughs> and so <laughs> I didn't have access to actually put a um, PowerPoint together. So I sent her the information, and she did this for me. So um, I, I'd like to thank Abby for all of her help in general. She <laughs> sets up the audiovisual, and she puts this out. So I've actually been in the remodeling business for 30 years. And 30 years ago, uh, we were still remodeling homes that had uh, 50 amp fuse boxes, one circuit to the kitchen. So today, we now need like 200 amp breaker boxes because we're putting like six or seven circuits to the kitchen with all of the new appliances. So obviously, we had to figure out how to save energy, and that is how Energy Star was born. So this is just like a little graphic going, you know, Energy Star on um, big appliance equals dollars, not to mention the fact that you're actually using less energy. So the history of Energy Star is that in 1992 it was a voluntary labeling and it was mostly computers and monitors because back then computers used huge amounts of electricity and they were huge. They took up whole rooms. So, you know, computers now obviously are quite different. You know, the thumbnail can hold more than a whole room to it then. 1995, the EPA expanded the labeling to office equipment, residential heating and cooling. Heating and cooling, as everyone knows, is the energy that's from the next speaker. And then in 1996, the EPA Department of Energy for Pacific Boys. So now there are tools on many different sites, including major appliances, office equipment, lighting, home electronics, new homes, commercial buildings, buildings and, and uh, plants. So the benefit number one is the lower use of energy, but that does equate to dollars, which is kind of the driving force for a lot of people to be motivated to do something. So in 2012 alone, $24 billion was saved by the Energy Star appliances. So it's also the driving force behind technological innovations that have greatly reduced energy consumption. So it's, it's kind of helped people move things along to get things going. Now, occasionally, power companies offer rebates on select Energy Star appliances. Right now, Idaho Power gives you $20 on a freezer, $30 on a refrigerator, and then they do have the See You Later refrigerator, where they come pick up your energy gobbling machine and give you $30. And they get rid of it. They want it off the grid. So all those people that have their second refrigerators in the garage, really doing a disservice. You actually would save money if you'd go out and buy a cheap Energy Star top mount freezer refrigerator for your garage than continuing to use that old refrigerator. And I'm subject to it. I have a 22-year-old refrigerator in my garage, and yeah, it's, it's gobbling energy. So, so we have energy rating. Now, some people think that just because you have an energy guide label, that it's Energy Star. So some will have the Energy Star, and I have a, an example here. Look for the Energy Star here if it's going to be Energy Star rating. Otherwise, it'll be blank. 
So for instance, these are from two top load washers. This is an Energy Star top load, and this is a non-Energy Star top load. And you can see, and the other thing is that, um, and I can go to the, um, that a lot of people always look at the dollar. Because our energy rates are different all over the country, it's important to really compare the kilowatt hours used. So you can see that the Energy Star 212 versus 488. So that's you know quite the quite a difference there. And then that's one that's um, up close. So in um, number one, that's going to be the the model number there. And number two is going to be the operating costs. Um, and the number three is it does it does talk about that it's going to depend on your utility rates and use. Um, and then this is an important one here: how much estimated kilowatt hours per year. And then this tells you you know what it is. So again, we get into graphs, and it's kind of amazing all the kind of different information that you see out there on the internet. And the best I could tell by checking out different sites and everything is, and who knows, this is like a typical family home. So the thing is, is that these homes are mixed with old homes and new homes. So this is just a very, very general average that 30% of the energy used in your home is from the appliances. And then here's another um, graph here. And as you can see that, you know, the air conditioning is huge. Um, this graph is a little bit confusing because I'm not sure. I think that some of the graphs uh, for some things take out the water heater uh, equation. For instance, your dishwashers and your washing machines, a lot of the energy that's used is from the water heater. So I think that sometimes that, that kind of skews some of the, the graph. And then this is a pie chart. And actually, if you added up um, appliance usage here, it gets close to the 30% um, usage. Now, this is just the electricity generation, kind of interesting, because we here in Idaho, uh, we have an abundance of hydroelectric power, which is why we have one of the lowest rates in the nation for energy consumption, and sometimes why maybe we're a little bit wasteful. Um, now, it hasn't, it has come with some sacrifices. Um, Bonneville Power Administration has had to do for that hydroelectric power. They have spent millions and millions of dollars in fish hatcheries to augment what happened when the, the dams went in. So now we're going to look, kind of look at each appliance and how they have reduced the consumption on them. So today's refrigerators use 75% energy than those of the 70s. And actually, this is a little chart, kind of interesting. A Frigidaire put it out. And it shows that a refrigerator from the 1970s till today, or actually a couple of years ago, $284 annual savings. So back to my refrigerator in my garage, two years would pay for a new refrigerator. Um, now, one thing that happens on refrigerators is that they now run most of the time. And the reason for that is so you don't have the ramping up of the capacitors to turn on the compressor all the time. So we get calls all the time. My refrigerator is running all the time. How can it be saving electricity? Well, it's just running at a lower thing. So um, it, it takes a, a lot of energy to pull those compressors back on. And then um, to meet this year's uh, Energy Star rating in 2014, every year they kind of like clamp down, clamp down, clamp down on the energy use. They were able to achieve it by using LED lighting. So any new refrigerator that you see that's this year's model will have LED lights inside it. Now, the thing about LED lighting is, number one, they use way less energy and you never, you're not ever going to have to replace them in the lifetime of a refrigerator. The other really, yes? No, because they're sealed. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know that they make a retrofit for the existing, you know, standard bulb. But the new ones are totally sealed. 
and they've become very smart too. They actually put them kind of at the front of the refrigerator so they shine back on the food instead of in the back of the refrigerator where you put the food in and you don't have any light. They're the kind of a side thing on the LED lights in the refrigerator because they greatly enhance the appearance of your food. I have LED lights. I at least have that in my main refrigerator. Um, and I have a glass bowl of lime, lemons and limes, and they're beautiful. I even had meatloaf in there, and it looked really nice. So it, it really, no, it's, it's really kind of amazing. And in our showroom, we've actually put colorful things in the LED um, refrigerators just to kind of, you know, show them off. Yes? Oh. That's really the key is whether it will fit because it will work in the future. It wouldn't, no be, there wouldn't be any negative of putting an LED in there if it fits. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, last a lifetime. So this is kind of interesting. This is showing how much it costs to operate a refrigerator over its lifetime. So back in 1990, we're talking, yeah, $1,500 refrigerator, and 2013, like $500. So it's, it's, it's dramatic. The dishwashers, how they have been able to reduce the energy usage on dishwashers is that they have smaller, more efficient motors, um, and they use a lot more sensors. So the thing with sensors is that if you don't need super hot water or super long cycles, it can determine, and they have like turbidity sensors and such, to determine really what kind of washing system that they need. Um, they recycle water to limit water. So the water comes in, and it gets dirty, and then they clean that water up and use it again. So they're not constantly bringing in more water from the water heater. And then they alternate wash arms for ideal pressure. So if you have this little bit of water in your dishwasher, and you have all these arms with all these holes in them, you're going to have pretty weak water pressure. So a lot of times the top will um, spray first, and then it'll go to the bottom arm, that way you get better pressure, but then you also get the advantage of the soaking of the top rack while the bottom rack is washing. Um, and then as a consumer, a lot of times you can kind of pick how efficient your appliance is by choosing, say, a light wash or energy saving and a non-heated dry. So, you know, that's kind of, you know, up to the consumer to, to further the energy consumption. or um, And then it's very important that you don't rinse the dishes. Rinsing dishes uses more water than the dishwasher will use cleaning your dishes. So, and the manufacturers, all the new dishwashers actually benefit from having some food on the dishes. It's called scrape, load, and go. So with the new dishwashing detergents that don't have the phosphates anymore, um, they have introduced things that really need the enzymes and the proteins to work together to create that washing action. However, it's very important that you do use a rinse aid or your glasses could be, you know, kind of cloudy. Clothes washers. We've done a lot with clothes washers. So Energy Star washers use up to 50% less water and 20% less energy. Um, if you choose, a, 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 again, the consumer can augment how much energy is used. So if you choose faster spin speeds, which means they extract more of the water, then it's going to spend less time in the dryer. And the dryers are large consumers of, of energy. Um, and also all your front loaders and a lot of your Energy Star top loaders, you can put more clothes in there, which is going to reduce the number of loads, which then in turn reduces how much energy you're using. Now, the front loaders do wash and rinse better. They are gentler on your clothes. Um, and then some, it's kind of interesting, some Energy Star top loaders have one cycle that meets the standards. So, for instance, there are top loaders out there that are Energy Star, but then there is a deep wash cycle which now negates that energy star. But at least there's a cycle on there that if you use it, 
it meets the Energy Star requirements. Yes. Oh. Okay. So the question was, is if you use the auto soak, does that take out any um, extra energy? Well, it's kind of interesting because most of the new machines have no soak cycles. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's, that's all kind of gone away. And I'm not really quite sure because a lot of people, myself included, is like, well, how can you have a washing machine without a soak cycle? But they've gone away. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, they're too busy putting in all these other cycles. <laughs> so, yes, so, right, right, yeah. And then your front loaders are still more efficient than your Energy Star top loaders. But they, you know, the Energy Star top loaders still, you know, meet the requirements. Um, the other thing that helps in washing machines is if they have a direct drive motor, they don't use as much energy. You don't have any slippage with the belt. Um, and then also there's another washing machine that there's a normal cycle and you just put on normal, that will meet Energy Star. As soon as you start adding extra rinses or doing everything else, then you, you've negated it. So, and we personally, we've had issues with the top loader Energy Star washing machines. We do have a number of complaints where they don't really seem to saturate the clothes. So there's a lot of people that don't want to go to front loaders. It's new, it's different, it, you know, but um, we have a lot more I'd say issues with the top loaders that are Energy Star than the front loaders. I mean, there are just some people, no matter what they have, they're not going to be happy. So, not that I have any customers like that. So, for its lifetime, notice that it used to be 1700 in 1990, down to $100. Wow. A dryers. That's kind of an interesting thing. I thought, hmm, how are dryers ever going to be Energy Star? I mean, they're plugged into 220. So we have heat pump models, um, and then we also have a new one. Now, right now, brand new, there are some dryers that are Energy Star. How they achieve that Energy Star rating is that they have increased the airflow, reduced the drying time, and put more sensors in so they can more accurately determine when the clothes are dry. So there's no wasted energy in over drying clothes, which also hurts your clothes. So those are actually brand new on the market now. Um, and then um, the heat pump models, that's where you have a heat pump that kind of recirculates, kind of pulls the moisture out, and then it drains the water out. So on the heat pump type, you don't need vents. They're ventless, but you do need a drain. So the heat pump dryers have actually been around for quite a while um, in Europe. But in Europe, you know, their dryers are, what, three cubic feet. Ours are 7.3. So it, it took a while for us to figure out how to make this heat pump system work, you know, on the American product. They compromising cycles. You know, it might take two hours to dry your clothes. Well, Americans are kind of impatient. So there's kind of a, a cycle there that kind of compromises, but it's still going to definitely reduce the, the energy usage. Now there are some. Is there a particular uh, company that's a leader in energy efficiency and clean uh, dryers? So the question was, is there a leader in the energy efficiency in dryers? Um, can I say brand names? Okay. So the ones, first one is Whirlpool. Whirlpool right now has the lesser of the Energy Star rating. By the end of this year, they will have the heat pump. I also have heard that LG will have the heat pump style. Okay, yeah, the article I read, you know. I mean, I know Whirlpool because I sell Whirlpool. I don't sell LG, but... They actually mentioned LG. What about uh, 
dishwasher? He wanted to know who's leading in dishwasher efficiency. Um, I don't have anything to back it up, but ASCO has always been kind of at the top of that game as, as far as using less um, water. And they don't have a heated dry as any of your European dishwashers don't have heated dries. The only problem is that some of them don't dry dishes because they don't have a heated dry, whereas the one brand, ASCO, they actually have a turbo dry, pulls air in, condenses the steam back to water, drains it out. So you're not having steam come out into the kitchen. And it actually does dry plastics, which is the complaint of a lot of people that have the European dishwashers without the heated dry. So again, there's some um, appliances that have not yet been rated. Your microwaves, your ranges, both gas and electric, your ovens, and your cooktops. However, there are um, some little features on some of these that do help with energy. So in um, ranges, both gas and electric, this is a trade name, Aqualift, but I don't know what the generic name for it is, but it uses 225 instead of 900 degrees, 30 minutes versus four hours. So a lot of your manufacturers are going away from self-cleaning ovens because they even tell you, they recommend that you do not use it before Thanksgiving because you may not have a turkey. Mm -hmm. Because of all the electronic controls that are now on appliances, that 900 degrees for four hours often can you know, cause those electronics to fail. So they're trying to go to this. So what it is is you put some water in the bottom and you hit the, the cycle and it only lasts like, you know, half an hour. So how they achieve this was they've actually reached the oven cavity with kind of a porous, it doesn't feel porous, but it is porous, hydroscopic. And so when you go through that cycle, it actually pulls the soil to the surface of that and then you wipe it out. Now it's not like the traditional self-clean, you're not gonna have ash on the bottom and you're gonna have to do just a little bit more wiping out. But if you do it regularly, not a problem. Now we've had some pushback because Consumer Reports um, tested it. And they tested it by smearing the entire in cavity of the oven with mustard and then baked it on. Guys, no, <laughs> that was not the manufacturer's intention. And one of my um, coworkers has the Aqualift and loves it. So uh, there's a lot of ovens out or ranges out there that have the double oven, a little small oven up top, big oven on the bottom. So you can use this, the smaller oven, uses less energy, takes quicker to, to heat up. So that's you know just a, a feature that you can use. Um, and then now I know not everybody's into microwave cooking, but if you do use it, it does shorten your time, so you're not, you know, you don't have the range on for as long. So now we have price of the ranges, and that is induction. So induction has been around, and um, it was here in the 80s, and it was very expensive, and it kind of went back to Europe. It's now back again, and the prices are just like the LEDs. The price is coming down, so that now you know it, it makes sense to go with it. So it's the most efficient energy use. It's more efficient than gas, and definitely more efficient than the electric elements. It does not heat up the room. So like in summertime, you know, you're not, you know, baking inside the oven. Also has the best response. So um, it will actually, if you put a, a pot of water on and turn on the burner to high it will boil water faster than gas or electric. And once it's at a rolling boil, you hit off and it's off. So it's the you know, best response. So what induction is this? Magnetic induction doesn't use a thermal or gas or a heating element. There's a copper coil that's underneath the surface and then there's an electricity char <laughs> charge through it. And what it does is it kind of excites the molecules in the ferrous material of the pan. So now it is true that that pan has got to hold a magnet because it is through magnetic induction that it is working. Um, and 
I mean, it's, a lot of your pans, you don't even realize, you just take a magnet and stick it on the bottom. If it, if it sticks, it will work. So it's kind of like, you know, when you put magnets together and they grab each other and then you turn them around and they kind of repel, that's kind of what's happening under there. Now, there's, it's a lot more technical than what I just kind of, you know, skimmed over. So, um, you know, it, you do see it really coming alive. You have to learn, kind of learn a cook with induction because it happens so much faster. You can't leave the stove unattended like you might have with a traditional coil, electrical coil oven. Well, because you still have control over how much power you're giving to it. So some of them even have what's called sensor boil, where if you put it on the sensor boil, you know, and pick that option, once it starts boiling, it'll automatically start to simmer down just a little bit. So um, I would think it would be so much nicer to cook on it than, say, a regular radiant, you know, smooth top. Now, the, the one thing that is, you know, a little discouraging about even induction, they don't recommend cast iron frying pans because it is a glass top. Yes, they will break if you drop a cast iron frying pan, you know, on them. So, but we, we've seen a great in surge of it. And uh, I would say it's no worse of a transition than going from electric to gas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you give us an idea of what the relative uh, efficiency is between uh, those two? Or what is you want to know the relative efficiency, and I believe it's about 16%. 16%? Mm -hmm. or yes. And the other the nice thing about induction is that okay, on this. Too, is that once that pan is, you know, rolling boil, I can put my hand right up to that pot. So it's a, also it's a very safe form. It's a safer form of cooking than some of the others. So you can actually put a piece of paper between the pan, pan and the surface and it will not do anything to it. So in summary, Energy Star has allowed us to lead more luxurious lifestyles through innovation, drastically reduced energy consumption per appliance. Now, and necessity is always the mother of invention. Now, interestingly enough, we're, our homes are 30% larger, we've got way more appliances, so there's not quite the drop in total consumption that you would imagine, but if you can imagine what it would be if we had not done Energy Star, we probably have rolling blackouts all the time. Okay. And my boss. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Uh, a comment about uh, freezers. Uh, about 20 years ago, I got one of these little gadgets uh, called Kilowatt, which allows you to measure energy consumption. Mm. I plugged it into the freezer downstairs. After a month worth of reading, it was uh, like we're going shopping. We can't afford this freezer anymore. So, uh, absolutely. What you say about old uh, refrigerators and freezers is mm -hmm. really true. Yep. Also, on dryers, uh, for your friends, family, and clients, make sure that the vents and the tubing are clear. If you have a sensor dryer like we did and uh, you have enough lint buildup where it's not venting properly, that thing will run for hours because it can't get rid of the moisture. So uh, maintenance will really help you save the energy that's advertised. And you can have a fire. Very dangerous. Uh, on that note of the dryer vent, I learned this from Jerry, that anytime you have a 90 degree or an elbow in your dryer vent, you're adding mm -hmm. a fill in of five feet of run to that mm -hmm. exhaust port. So, you know, if you look behind a lot of dryers, you've got two, three turns before it leaves the home. You're adding 15 feet right there, which will definitely reduce the efficiency mm -hmm. of the dryer. And that also happens in ventilation over a range or a cooktop. The more elbows you have, you're better to have two 45s than a 190. So thank you, Lindell. Um, we are due for a little bit, about a 15-minute break. Um, our bathrooms are this way, down the long hall, making rights. So we need to do that. We've got some snacks in the back, and we will be back uh, at 8.10 to uh, finish up the rest of the presentation.
Welcome back to part two of the energy efficient components topic for sustainable energy, sustainable homes. This is November 2014 and we've uh, just heard about energy efficient lighting and a little overall look at how um, home energy use is distributed across um, appliances and HVAC systems. And uh, we're moving into, in particular, the HVA systems here. We've got some speakers from A1 Heating and Air Conditioning, um, and Mike Casper and Andy yeah. Scow are going to tell us a little bit more about some of the new technologies that um, use less energy to keep your home comfortable, uh, heated, and cooled. Mike? Thank you. So um, when we start talking about this a little bit, we... Um, you know, a lot of the technology is really nothing new, but uh, just enhancements on, you know, a lot of technology that has been around for a long time. Um, so what we decided to focus on, it seems like the majority of the improvement in our industry is in the field of heat pumps. We see the technology really focused in that way. And even though gas furnaces are getting more efficient and things like that, it seems like because of the uh, popularity of ductless heat pumps and variable speed, you know, electric motors and things like that. We see the heat pumps getting a lot more energy efficient, and that seems to be where most of the movement is. So we thought we'd focus tonight on um, heat pumps and um, a little bit and kind of go through that. Heat pumps of the past, you know, we hear this a lot. I go to four or five different homes a day, and when you mention heat pumps, you see people's face drop and go, oh, my God, I had a heat pump in the 80s, and it was the worst thing I ever dealt with in my life. You know, and, and it is true. And, uh, you know, uh, 10, 15 years ago, heat pumps were not very energy efficient. They were fairly unreliable as far as machines go. They didn't last very long. I mean, if you got 7 to 10 years out of a heat pump, you know, 15 years ago, that was pretty good, you know. Uh, and, you know, the biggest complaint probably – you know, if you had a good running heat pump and it was putting out 85 air, that was, wasn't very comfortable to folks, especially if they had the good old, you know, oil furnace that was pumping out 140 degree air, you know, going to 80 just didn't, didn't cut it for them. Um, but fast forward to today, uh, today's heat pumps are quite a bit different machines. And we have a, seen a lot of improvement over the last just five to 10 years. and I think uh, probably, like I said, the technology is focused in that direction and is going to get much more, uh, much more technology we're going to see going into that form of heating. So today we see much lower cost of operation. There's a lot of different forms. I talk about three, you know, ductless heat pumps, obviously, and uh, just regular central geothermal type heat pump systems. That's kind of the three things we're going to focus on. So first off, ductless heat pump. How many here are familiar with ductless heat pump systems or seen them? Good. So majority of you have seen one form or another of a ductless heat pump system. Um, one of the obvious uh, advantages is there's no ductwork. Ductwork is inherently pretty inefficient, isn't it? I mean, especially if it's ran in an unconditioned space like a crawl space or an attic. Uh, you're losing or gaining a lot of heat through the ductwork. It's leaky at the joints. And even if it's not ran in, a, in an unconditioned space, just the amount of energy it takes to push air through a duct and, and the losses you have with friction and things like that uh, is pretty inefficient. So by being able to eliminate that, obviously, is a good thing. creates a lot of energy. Um, variable volume is the other major thing about ductless heat pumps because they're put together completely with variable speed type motors and inverters, they are able to speed up or slow down to match the exact heating or cooling load that the room actually needs. So instead of having a unit that's big enough for 100 degree weather and cycling on and off and on and off, the unit speeds up to whatever amount of cooling it needs. And throughout the day or year, it is able to maximum capacity or slow down depending on the load. Um, and that kind of ties in down here. We kind of put this down here at the bottom, but uh, we talked about uh, the zonal abilities of them and, and their load chasing abilities. Um, and I think this is kind of one thing that's really unique and is not usually taken into account when you're talking about ductless heat pump systems. 
But <clears throat> everywhere where you have one of these little indoor units, or each room or each section of the home is virtually like having its own little heating and cooling system in that room. So you may have one outdoor unit like this one and as many as four or five of these indoor units. And the outdoor compressor, if one unit is running by itself, it only speeds up to the capacity of that one unit. But if all five of them are running, it can speed up to handle all of them. So it can match the needed heating and cooling uh, of the home or the area. But I think what's kind of neat here, and we kind of put this little slide together, um, if you had a home like this and you had maybe you know units on this side of the house, one in each room, uh, in the morning when the sun came up and you had a, a cooling load on this side of the home, then you, you know, those units would speed up and be able to focus the air conditioning to that part of the house and you're not air conditioning the part of the house that obviously doesn't need it like you would with a central system. And then as the day goes on, maybe the sun travels to the other side of the house, now your cooling load has moved over here. So these units can ramp down or slow down in capacity and then these can speed up over here on this side of the house. So in effect you're just following the load throughout the day. Um, and then obviously too the rooms that are in use. You know, um, if you know primary use in a oops in a bedroom is you know overnight or during one part of the day and then the rest of the day is down here, obviously this unit can be off, this unit can be on, vice versa. So there's a lot of flexibility when it comes to ductless heat pumps that add to their energy efficiency. A lot of times not taken into account. Um, and then the other nice thing about them is they're pretty easy to add to an existing home. You don't have to have ductwork. So virtually anywhere you can run a few small pipes. You can see little pipes here and, and uh, you can usually figure out a way to install one. And they're great just if you don't want to heat and cool your entire home, um, but maybe you have a bonus room or a particular room that uh, just, you know, doesn't heat or cool very well. That's a great application for them as well. Um, but there's maybe a downside. This is one thing that we ran into in our area, uh, and that is they are heat pump units. I don't know what happened to our heat pump slides. I guess they're missing. We lost them. Um, but they are heat pump units. How many people understand what heat pump is? Basically, heat pump. Okay, a couple. We'll run through it. We put a couple here to kind of help us out with it. But basically, you're taking heat out of the air outside and transferring it inside. And even though it may feel cool to us outside, there's still heat that we can extract from it. But once it gets below a certain temperature outside, and for ductless heat pumps it seems to be at 10, 0 to 10 degree neighborhood, once it gets colder than that outside, there's not a lot of heat for us to extract, even with these ultra efficient uh, units. And they're, they're getting better and getting down to colder temperatures. But you're going to have to have some kind of backup heat. And ductless heat pump systems don't built in like a typical heat pump system would, like electric heaters. So you're going to have to have for that be a fireplace or electric space heaters or whatever the case. But there's a lot of different options out there. But that is the one maybe uh, limitation or downside of them. Um, any questions about this heat pump over here? When you have uh, several units in the um, various rooms and the central one unit outside the room, the manifold or all the, uh, where do all the pipes meet? Well, a uh, good question. His question is um, about the piping for ductless heat pumps when there's multiple indoor units. And uh, Every manufacturer, there's a lot of different variations. Most manufacturers have all the lines from each individual indoor unit go all the way back to the indoor unit. And so at the outdoor unit, you may have four or five sets of pipes coming off of it going into the house. There are systems, however, out there that are pretty neat, um, mostly using commercial applications where you can have as many as eight to 12 indoor units. And then they use um, maybe a manifold system inside where they have one large set of pipes that goes to a box it's like a manifold and then they spider off to the individual indoor units. Um, Daikin uh, is another manufacturer that used a, a Y system. They would run a one pipe in and then it would Y off to one unit and then, you know, and you just got to Y it off as you went to each indoor unit. So there's a few variations, but the majority of them that you use in residential applications are going to have piping go all the way from the indoor unit all the way to the outdoor unit. 
Um, you do have to drain each indoor. The question was, uh, where does the condensation drain? On uh, you, every individual indoor unit will have a condensation drain. So when you, do, one of the things you have to be diligent about on the installation is making sure you're located in an area where you can drain it. So exterior walls seem to be the preferable because you just run the drain off the wall and down to the ground. They do make pumps that you can insert in the units and pump the water, but there's a lot of, uh, you need to kind of be careful of that. The pumps are kind of noisy, so that's one complaint we've had, you know, where so pumps coming on all the time and pumping condensation out and, and it makes a lot of noise. The other thing is a lot of people are inclined to put a little pump on it and then run the line through the attic. Well, you've got to take caution to make sure that line doesn't freeze in the wintertime and, and cause you a lot of issues there. So. Uh, Typically, our company anyway tries to avoid the pumps if at all possible. Sometimes you can't. So, so uh, how much energy uh, is used for each kind of energy produced? Um, so, I assume you're referring to COPs or cost of performance. Or, you know, okay. So, um, most ductless heat pump systems, uh, it's it's really difficult to tell. And, and here's why. When it comes to heat pump testing and ratings as far as energy usage, in our country, the corporate, the, the organization who does all the testing only tests equipment at maximum capacity. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the unit obviously is much more energy efficient because a large part of the time it's not going to be running at max capacity. It's going to be at a much slower speed. But COPs generally are three to five. So, and for those of you who don't know what a COP is, heat pumps come with a rating where one for every kilowatt of electricity you burn, you get three or four kilowatts worth of heat out of it. Versus like a straight electric heater, like it would, it would be in just a straight electric furnace, that would have a COP of one, right? You burn one kilowatt worth of electricity, you get one kilowatt worth of heat out of it. So these little units, uh, you get three or four kilowatts worth of heat for every kilowatt used, typically, or more. Any more questions? What is the um, the heat carrying fluid that's in the pipes between the the heat pump unit and the man or the, the fan units on the inside of the home? It's a standard refrigerant um, nowadays. It's uh, the refrigerant we use is R four ten A. And so it's, uh, I guess, a generic term, Freon, you know, is what you would refer to it as, so. Yep. I was just curious, for these units, do you find them mainly used for air conditioning? Or, you know, because you said they need some backup heat, possibly. So what's the major demand for them, air conditioning or for both? Or no. Um, we do use them a lot for heating. Um, like I said, because of their ability to go to fairly low temperatures, like I said, it seems to be around 10 degrees. It depends on how they're sized for the space that you're heating, obviously. But um, they can usually heat the space down to around 10 degrees, and below that is when you have, are going to probably find that you're going to want some kind of auxiliary heat. So in our area, you know, tonight being the exception, <laughs> We have a, have a lot of time where our temperatures drop below that during the winter. I mean, we obviously have a few, and so you make plans for that. But most of our customers use them for heating and cooling both. You can get cooling-only versions of them, though. Uh, we seem to use those a lot for uh, IT rooms and, and places like that where there's just really no heating need for heating or heating modes. But um, uh, they do get used a lot for heating in our area. In fact. I have a few new construction homes we've done here in the last couple, just the last year or so, where we've exclusively put in ductless heating cooling systems, and then they have some some small forms of backup heat. But um, the one client I talked to the other day had never even used their backup heat. So, so yeah, it's pretty likely. It, it depends on the the user too. I mean, when we say backup heat, the average you know. Some people will, the heat pump might sit there and run constantly and keep the house, you know, above 50 or 60, but it may not keep it at whatever comfort level that that consumer wants. 
So when we start talking about having to use backup heat, it kind of is relevant to the user too. So um, because of the ductless heat pump technology using variable speed compressors and things like that, now we're starting to see um, central heat pump systems come out similar where we have compressors that are very speed motors in them. Um, so uh, this is a picture of the Lennox unit that, that uh, does that. Um, they're extremely high energy efficiency, um, in most cases upwards of 25 SEER or so, and EERs of, or uh, HSPF ratings of, uh, in some cases, 13 and higher. So uh, they're extremely energy efficient heat pump systems. Um, again, they have variable heating and cooling ability, so going back to like the ductless unit, if your house, you know, it only needs a little bit of heating or a little bit of cooling, it only speeds up to that, match that amount, but throughout the day or season, and it's able to speed up and obviously do a full load. So instead of having a, a large unit that's oversized for maybe a, a shoulder month, like, you know, April or something like that, it's, it gives you just the amount you need. Um, we're finding, it used to be in the old days, this is kind of interesting, uh, it used to be just a few years ago that nobody put heat pumps in town if they had gas available. It was one of those things where you don't have gas available and you're out in the country, it's better than the alternative. But uh, nowadays, because our heat pumps are much, much more energy efficient, these central heat pumps actually are, uh, the cost of operation on them is a lot less than even an extremely high efficient gas furnace uh, down to some, you know, to, to certain limits. So we're finding now a lot of times, even in urban areas where there's gas heat available, we still put in heat pumps, um, uh, use gas furnaces as backup heat. Those we usually call dual fuel or hybrid systems because you have gas and electric heat both. Um, so I'll put down here balance points. Um, typically you don't run a gas furnace and heat pump simultaneously. And so there's a temperature at which the outdoor temperature when the heat pump is, you know, not as cost effective to heat with and the gas furnace is going to be more cost effective. So there's a lot of factors that play into that, but you can sit down and actually look at the cost we pay for electricity, the cost we pay for gas, the energy efficiency of the heat pump, the energy efficiency of the furnace, and come up with the exact temperature that saves you the most money. Um, so like we put a couple down here. Uh, you know, this heat pump is ultra high efficient, but if you paired it with like a 98 centi furnace, then it points around 35 degrees. You would use the heat pump to heat your house till it got to be 35 degrees outside, and then it would shut off and turn on the, the gas furnace. And of course, we have controls and stuff nowadays. You have to do it manually, it does it all automatically behind the scenes. You don't see it. Um, but if you had a low or mid grade furnace uh, that wasn't very energy efficient, um, your heat pump will probably heat your house for less cost down as low as maybe 15 or even lower. So it just kind of depends on the type of furnace you have. So we find that that's pretty interesting. A lot of folks who have maybe a, a basic heating and cooling system in their home, when the air conditioner goes out, they replace it with a heat pump because a heat pump version, so the heat pump version of this unit in an air conditioner is only about roughly $1,000 more expensive. So the payback is fairly rapid on it. Any questions on central heat pump systems? Josh? You, uh, um, <laughs> oh, yeah, that uh, I'm so excited. Um, <laughs> I, I, sorry, I, I'm, and I'm, I'm struggling with the question. I mean, to what extent does that, um, does the heat that comes from heat pump, I mean, to what extent is, is that unit like that we're looking at the picture of there mm -hmm. is parable with, with, I mean, say you have, I mean, you know, there's a furnace in the home already. There's mm -hmm. already a fan with an air handle that is pushing air around. To what extent can that just put heat into that? Or does it really need to be paired with, you know, fairly, you know, with a newer air handler, with newer ducting system to really work at the efficiencies it needs to? Um, you can uh, literally pair a heat pump pretty much to anything with a fan in it. Um, obviously, sizing is a limit limitation, right? So 
if the fan in the existing furnace is only capable of blowing so much air, then that limits the size heat pump we can connect to it. So in some cases, if the home requires uh, this size, you know, a four-ton heat pump, but the, the air handler that's existing is only capable of blowing three and a half tons or three tons worth of airflow, then obviously we're limited by that. But I've put uh, heat pump systems just in the last couple of years on 20-year-old oil furnaces. You know, uh, we have a lot of customers live out in the country, still have oil furnaces, and they go, "What? You know, fuel oil is four dollars a gallon. What do I do?" And you know, we say, "Well, you know, if you want to keep the oil furnace, keep it, use it for backup heat, and um, put a heat pump on, and it's a pretty good solution for them." You know, they they still use a little bit of oil throughout the year, depending on you know how cold it gets, but it you know cuts their heating costs in some cases in a third. Uh, in fact, in that particular type of instance, I've had customers who fi literally financed the heat pump, and what they saved more than made the payment. So it was a pretty good investment for them. But. Let me interject here. We're at 835, okay. and we do want to leave a little, uh, enough time for Goldie. So okay. I'll speed through the rest. <laughs> uh, the other type of heat pump that we... Uh, See a lot of advancement coming is geothermal type heat pumps. So um, the, the kind of neat thing about them is they're ultra energy efficient. Um, there's a, some pretty nice tax credits, 30% on them for the next couple years, uh, but they are fairly expensive. So these are some of the different types. If you're not familiar with geothermal types, we can get you more information on them, but these are the ones where you bury the pipes in the ground and or use well water. Uh, the other thing we just wanted to touch on, it's something I feel like and we feel like in our area is an indoor air quality product that's highly undervalued and underused, and that is HRVs. So I think uh, a lot of you guys are probably pretty familiar with HRVs and how they work and why they're a good idea. Um, but uh, obviously we can get more information on that for those of you who would like to have more on it. But Go ahead. Just a quick question about the heat. Uh, geothermal heat pumps. So is that pretty much, uh, do you have a real a big requirement for land area to be able to do those things? Is that the big limiting factor or? Well, it used to be, um, but actually not anymore. Um, you can um, do different types of loop systems that uh, really can take very little space. Um, for example, you can just drill holes straight down and they can be uh, within about a, you know, 12 foot area and literally just they might go down 200 feet deep you know and drop the pipes down and uh, the cost is a little bit higher than just digging trenches uh, but you can do that um, we tend to do a lot of them where we just dig big long trenches so if you have, those take a lot of land obviously yeah a lot of space but not totally necessary there's ways around it but expensive on the HRV, Jerry, if you could kind of succinctly tell the room about the um, the code side of that and how we're looking at homes that are built very tight and um, and what that does to a home and how an HRV system might be beneficial there. So the, the new 2012 code is out. We have ventil minimum ventilation tables. Um, anytime you go below five air changes an hour, we have to provide some type of mechanical ventilation. The average in the state right now is 3.6 air changes per hour, and so we're going to have to add something into it. Um, the, the HRV is a good way to deal with it. There's a, a quite a substantial upfront cost, but again, the more we use these products, the prices are coming down on them, so we're seeing a fairly dramatic reduction on these, and hopefully they'll get back to a, a payback. Where we where we can actually pay for them. So right now the payback on the is still out a little bit. Yeah, I think you know the HRVs are. I think they're running in about the two thousand dollar neighborhood installed. Um, I tried to find some data today on you know versus just mechanical air coming in from outside versus having the you know the heat exchanger and and how much you know what the savings would be on an annual basis because you're recovering a lot of that heat. Couldn't find any definitive information on it data yet, so still working on that. But um, 
but yeah, as opposed to having a fan just sucking in 100 degree air in the summertime and you know potentially zero degree air in the wintertime, um, you're recovering the heat that you've paid for in your home and, and you know still accomplishing the same thing. So it is true the initial upfront cost is, is a little bit, but there's got to be a, a payback. I'm just not exactly showing the exact amount of time. Um, just can you give a little explanation on like where this would go in your house, just kind of like you did the heat bump because I don't have any experience with this. And okay. So like Do you what know it's, it, what it's for and then? Yeah. HRVs are, are called heat recovery ventilators. <laughs> and what they're really for is um, a lot of modern day homes, especially the ultra energy efficient homes, are built extremely tight. And so there's not a lot of infiltration or air coming into the building from outside. So what happens is the, the air inside the building gets stale from just people breathing or things like that. So um, there needs to be fresh air coming into the building somehow. Um, you can do it one of two ways. It can literally just be your, you know, a fan sucking in air from the outside. Um, but obviously the downside of that is you're sucking in whatever temperature the air is outside. Uh, and then somehow you've got to be exhausting air out of that building too because you know, you've know you got to be moving air through it. So you're you're exhausting air out of the building that you paid to heat or cool, and you're bringing in air from outside that is obviously unconditioned. So what a heat recovery ventilator does is uh, you see it has four outlets here, or two inlets and two outlets. Basically, you're take, sucking air out of your house, and it's going through this heat exchanger here, and any heat or cooling, for lack of a better term, it gets extracted in this heat exchanger, and then the air gets blown outside, the dirty air. And then clean air comes in from outside, goes through the heat exchanger, the heating or cooling gets put back into that air and put inside. So you're bringing in fresh air, exhausting bad air out of your home without losing a lot of energy. Okay, just one last question. So in a residential home, in a single-family home, where would you put that apparatus? Would it be close to your furnace? Would it if you have a central heating and cooling system, the most popular way would be to locate it next to the furnace, and it would be connected right to the duct system for the regular heating and cooling system, and it would basically use that duct system. Um, in a lot of homes, like when you go up to Sun Valley and Ketchum area, a lot of those houses use radiant-type heating, which is what Goldie's going to talk about. In those areas, they may not have a duct system if they have no air conditioning because they use radiant floor heat. So you can actually attach duct systems to these where – you're sucking air out, you know, dirty air out of parts of the house, like the bathrooms and laundry room and things like that, where the majority of the stale air is, and then you're blowing the clean air in. So you can, there's multiple ways you can do it. Thanks. Anybody else? I would just add to that that part of the issue here in Idaho where we have soils that are derived from granite bedrock is radon, and that is being introduced into the home via negative pressure as you turn on your exhaust fan for your stove or for your bath fan and all of a sudden you've got a negative pressure in the home because you're pumping air out and you've got a sealed tight envelope and it's got to come from somewhere. So it might come from your crawl space or your basement where radon is prevalent and that can enter the home. So that's another reason that HRVs are um, a part of the discussion about um, Idaho's uh, residential building code and, and how they fit in there. Is that it? <laughs> Turn it to on, does that work? Okay. Um, clicker. Uh, so my name is Goldie, um, and I'm with uh, Flying Cowboys Design. So basically, just me, and, and I'm uh, happy to support this uh, series of seminars. And. Uh,
Concerns that are separate. The roof has to be built a certain way. The windows dictate you know, how I'm doing the studs in the wall. So I end up going back to double cup paste. Um, excuse me, that was a little bit of advanced information. Talking to the gentleman here. Um, I have a few of these. Hopefully, we'll be talking about the radiant system later. And uh, on the second page is a little schematic. Um, for this system I'd like to talk about called this open direct system. Um, and that is for sure I'm in uh, out, of, out of Vermont of all places but uh, anyway. Um, a couple of First things I wanted to say, it, should I go ahead and be talking if we don't have slides? Okay. Um, I just wanted to cover real quick what motivated me to uh, start pursuing it. Um, we're all real familiar with this. Uh, you know, when I personally about 15 years ago learned uh, how much energy buildings used uh, compared to you know, everybody complains about gas guzzling SUVs. I'm like, that's not the game. The game is uh, how much energy houses do How much energy houses do So, I wanted to get into this. Hang on to those. Uh, they'll make more sense when we get to the end here. Yeah. Along with that tight turn that you just saw, let me go ahead and step ahead a little bit. Um, only has 30 years of life and then the mortgage ends and and it'll be replaced. No, no, it's never the case. Homes that shouldn't be here exist for 30 years past their, you know, intended life. And so it's really common for me to work on a home that's 70, 80, even a couple of hundred year old buildings. And um, so the amount of energy they use over their lifetime is staggering. So that's another reason I wanted to kind of uh, tackle this area of the business. Um, so that's why I'm starting this stuff. A couple, after I learned about advanced framing, um, how energy is used in a wall, um, and I don't think I've got, okay, I can leave there. Um, I figured out that 
this wouldn't be that hard to do. Um, and and uh, one of my favorite uh, ideas is figure out how come no one does the advanced framing or closed and conditioned crawl spaces. And uh, I figured out it was just the inertia of the building industry. And there's no reason these things can't be done today. Um, advanced framing, this is a, a real simple schematic down here, is look how many fewer members there are in the wall system and how much less wood. So one of the goals when you, you're doing advanced framing is, is actually to remove as much wood as you can from the wall system because it, it actually conducts electric, uh, electricity, energy uh, to the outside of the building. You want more uh, captured airspace, you know, so that's your insulation. Um, another thing I learned about several years ago was uh, closed or conditioned attics and crawl spaces. Um, after you understand the air circulation in a house and where energy is lost, um, you, it's pretty easy to come to the conclusion that no home should have a conventional attic uh, anymore. Um, your typical pitched roof with your uh, blanket of bone ins insulation laying on your ceiling with a big air cavity above it is a, is a really, really poor system. So uh, closed attics and then uh, conditioned crawl spaces, um, then you stick your uh, plumbing and other devices underneath the house and then you stick vent holes all through it and you've got all this air running underneath your house it's it's either hot or it's cold um, so all you have to do is exchange the air in that crawl space and then you're allowed to seal it up and have it become kind of part of the energy envelope of the building so um, I got advanced framing and then the conditioned crawl spaces and um, closed attic systems um, and then I was learning about the different energies that are involved in a wall system. Um, you've got conductive, convective, convection, and then uh, radiation. Um, so how can you tackle these three different kinds of energy? So the conduction, we use the uh, advanced framing to lessen the amount of wood and the pathway uh, for energy outside of the house, plus the uh, that system that's on the inside of the house, which is pictured on the little drawing I gave you, um, but I don't have a slide for it, but it helps uh, right in the bottom corner. It shows how you put the little bats inside the wall to lessen the thermal connection with this set. Um, so that's, that's how you can change the path where the energy is conducted. Um, convection inside of a wall system, especially an old bat wall system, a lot of air would move around. So the real simple answer to that is to have an insulation system where there's no void and you've conquered the, the whole energy traveling through the wall up or down with a convection system. Um, radiation has a, a funny aspect where you're trying to actually uh, you can actually push some energy back out of the house if you can put a air gap with a foil-faced membrane on it. Um, and so you can use that in your siding to reflect some energy, unwanted energy, back outside. Um, so uh, I kind of developed a package of uh, things that I put together, uh, uh, systems in a house. Um, and what led me to do that was at first to understand the temperature uh, swings that we have in Boise, the climate that we have here. Um, we have a, we're in a real unique place where we're not a pure cooling or a pure heating, but we are more a, a predominantly a, a heating place, um, which means that the air conditioning load could be lessened quite a bit on a building. So you can see here that um, during the summer, we get June, July, and August, there's uh, as much as 30 degree temperature swing between the night and the day temperature. And um, if you have a properly constructed building, 
you can use that nighttime temperature and mitigate some of the need for air conditioning. Um, okay, another part of that strategy, which we've talked about here several times uh, with Steve, is a night flush. So you, it, it, during the evening, because of the 30 degree temperature swing, you turn on a whole house fan of, of some type and open, have corresponding windows that are open, and bring this 70 degree air, 65, 70, 60 degree air in, um, as opposed to the 90 degree air of the daytime. And with several air exchanges, um, possibly like, uh, Steve has a, we, we talked about this, he had a good figure for it. You need 10 to 15 air exchanges for the house. Does that sound right? It's a lot. A lot of air exchanges. Yeah. Yeah. The inside of the structure, you're trying to cool all the uh, furnishings, um, you know, the walls. And then I also have uh, a concrete floor involved. You're trying to cool the concrete floor. Um, so we use night flush to help mitigate the need for air conditioning um, the concrete floors. Now, yes? Is the night flush synonymous with the term the commercial energy efficiency people talk about when they say an economizer? Is that the, is that the same term? The same I'm not philosophy? familiar with that term, the economizer. Does anybody, Does anybody know? here know what that? Yeah, it's, it's not exactly the same. The hardware is pretty similar, but the way you run it is a little bit different. So. We'll leave it at that for the second time. Okay. Um, anyway, so this, uh, real quick, the concrete floors, I try to get my clients to use these uh, in our homes. I've done like four in a row now because of the necessity to put a mass in the home. So if you have a two to four inch concrete floor, um, you can alleviate all the temperature swings inside your structure during the day. Um, typically, there's there's about a five degree temperature swing uh, when I get a house with a good concrete floor. Um, in addition to that, just to a note, only one of them has been a slab on grade. The other three have been a two inch slab that's on actually a wooden floor system, so we still have a crawl space that we condition in, but it allows access to uh, for maintenance and everything else for all of your plumbing and wiring and that kind of stuff. Um, okay, so my little package. Um, air sealing and robust insulation. And I put that uh, at the top because we talk about energy efficient components or all these different ways to heat and cool or to get energy. Um, but the very first thing you need to do, you need to do is not waste it. So um, I can take these items and put them in a, home, in a new home for almost the same cost as conventional construction, except the insulation. There's no way around spending more on insulation, and we just need to do that. Um, air sealing is a big deal. Uh, I've got special siding that I use. Also, uh, you know, they like to make jokes at me down at the lumber yard because I will have bought 15 bo boxes of caulking to use in the house as we're putting it together for every joint that um, has any potential for an air leak. Um, so anyway, insulation and air sealing. And then I use the advanced framing to take out the wood out of the walls, get more insulation in there, um, night flush to help cool it, uh, concrete floor to alleviate temperature swings, um, and then finally we get to the hydronic heating. The concrete floor and the heating go really well and it's advantageous to have either, but the, it, the hydronic heating is perfect in the concrete floor. So once you understand you need a mass and I've got my hydronic heating, that's what I try to sell to everybody. Um, the, I guess the goal here just you know, we talked about mitigating the need for air conditioning. If I can get away from air conditioning, I can get away from having a furnace system. So I have no furnace of any 
sort in the house. Um, and then talking about mitigating the need for air conditioning, um, I do pay a little bit of attention to uh, what I call emergency air conditioning, which is if the client's really, really worried about it, then we recommend, uh, I can recommend a, a mini split sort of system, or actually two of the last four homes, uh, we simply put holes in the walls and put a little window unit air conditioner in there. And in both cases, um, $150 window unit air conditioner is enough to cool this, these homes on the 20 days that they might need some extra cooling during the year. So that's why I use the term emergency air conditioning. Um, and then, you know, if I have no furnace system, that's like a seven to ten thousand dollar item. And then by the time I use my uh, Radiant Tech company and hydronic heating, uh, I will spend somewhere in the five to seven thousand dollar range. And then I also get to um, save the expense of a finished floor system for a house. And a concrete floor so far has always been cheaper than any alternative, that, you know, uh, hardwood or tile or anything like that. So um, it, it, it works. Okay, real quick, the heating system. Um, you had a chance to glance at that thing uh, from Radiant Tech. It's called an open direct uh, hydronic heating system. Um, the reason they use the term open direct is uh, they've got, it's really intriguing, they, they have uh, the water, your street water, comes into the house and goes through the floor system on its way to the water heater. So we have no coolant, no uh, glycol or whatever it's called. Uh, um, so we don't have two separate systems, no heat exchangers or anything like that. Um, plus, part of this air conditioning mitigation strategy is we've actually got a limited cooling capacity. You've got 45 or 50 degree water that comes into the floor system, and during the summer, that'll sit in the floor system on its way to the water heater and absorb heat out of the room and become whatever the room is, 60, 70 degrees. Um, and this is also preheating the water on, on its way to the water heater, so you get kind of a, a double benefit there. Um, so I think that's really efficient. Another interesting part about this with the hydronic heating is it's actually somewhat inefficient to do it in the old typical way where they used to use boilers, and so a boiler would fire and have water that's about 160 degrees and pump that through the floors and do it for shorter bursts of energy. But um, by using 120 degree water uh, from your water he heater, okay, I didn't make, maybe make that clear, the, the heating for the house is from your water heater. So now we also have the efficiency of double duty for your water heater. Instead of it sitting there cycling on and off during the day or having another appliance like a furnace, the water heater heats the water for your house, for your domestic use, plus heats your floor. And that's what heats the house. Um, one of the old paradigms for using a water heater and only using 100 degree water is uh, a few years ago, you would, I would typically encounter the, that'll never work because it's not hot enough. So uh, that goes back to the robust insulation. You have to have a well-sealed building and a robust insulation package for this to, to work because it's, it is an extremely low BTU system compared to a boiler or a furnace system. Um, th that being said, every time we've done a manual J for a house, or the Radiant Tech company sends me back their little calculations for the house, um, we still have been, we're, we're still overboard with our water heater. We still have plenty of BTUs and energy to heat the house. So we've never come close to where there might be a problem you know, with heating it. The question was, was that a four or five kilowatt water heater? Um, so what we've ended up using the water heater of choice is, a, is an on-demand gas modulating water heater. 
And they typically we use like two sizes that are 115 or 120 to 150 thousand BTUs. So that's the only way I know to look at that and measure that. Um, the, the key with that is the, is the modulating because we've actually got uh, hot water coming back from the floor system. It only, when it goes to the floor for this open direct system, 120 degree router, it's actually coming back to the water heater at about 100 degrees. So with these new tankless water heaters, as long as you hear the word modulating in there, it actually tones the flame down because then it's only trying to heat it up 10 or 15 degrees to get it back out again. It just circulates through the floor. So um, you got you got that what makes it so efficient is to have the on-demand gas modulating water heater along with the hydronic system. Um, and I've had great success with them. They're, these components I get from this company um, are just plug and play and just myself and the plumber do this system. We don't, uh, we don't have to hire a heating contractor for that aspect of it. Um, Mike's going to throw that question. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, their their place in this world is secure. You still need to hire someone, you know, that gets the mech permit for everything. Um, but uh, how am I doing on time? Really quick, I wanted to say the HRVs are really important. Um, I think I'm – am I out of slides? Oh, I'll get back to that one in a second. The uh, HRVs are super important, um, and those are provided for me by the mechanical company. And uh, – I wanted to say that they also don't just give you fresh air, but when you have a home that has makeup air problems, I've been told by my inspector and the gentleman right here that, that the HRV allows for that, and so will satisfy that, that need for makeup air. And um, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, we, we use the term stale, it's basically poison. And they were, do you need to remove all the poisons from your house, whether you have radon or whether you have a bunch of cleaning compounds that you stick underneath your sink or whether you do cooking or whether you just do breathing. So I agree with the HRV that we all, we need them. We need them in more, more houses and more applications. Um, uh, I've got this one other slide. Is there any more after that? Okay, there's the tubes. This one really quick. This is my version of the night flush. Um, you can see it's on a wall, a vertical, as opposed to the old picture, that one. See, this one, if you look at it closely, you can see it's venting into an attic, an imaginary attic. And so this is a, a non-starter. We do not have attics like that anymore. Um, so I've got this one, and it just pulls from a, a tall point in the house, and we've got it set on a timer during the summer, and there's actually... A, a little foam-filled uh, door that fits on that during the um, during the winter, and you just remove it once, you know, and, the, and then put it back in it in the winter. Um, here's the hydronic tubing down on the floor. Um, I think it's a little hard to tell right here, though. You can tell I've got a bottom plate and actually a little piece of OSB, so that is two inches. It helps with laying down the concrete. This is an electrical outlet in the middle of the floor that the client wanted. Um, these look a little intimidating when you do them, but it just took me the first house before I could get the patterns and how you zone it and how you lay it. It's, it's really simple. And uh, that coupled with the open direct, where you get the fresh water coming in, I, I don't think homes should be heated any other way myself now. Um, did I... Does this sound like a pretty efficient system? Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I, I get it from uh, the Radiant Tech company. They send me a package of stuff. The, um, it, to put PEX, it's PEX. To put it in concrete, it needs to have this particular oxygen barrier in it. So it's a little different than the PEX you buy for plumbing. You get it specifically for this purpose. And, you know, you just ensure that there's no joints in it and no holes in it, and it's a 100-year product. So you can't dig in your floor after you do this. Anyway. Okay, we'll 
Gosh, thank you. I don't know if there are any more questions. I know I'm over time. And hopefully that made sense and I wasn't speaking too, too fast. Okay, well, thanks, everybody. We had a few technical difficulties, but um, your patience helps us put this online so other people can see it as well. And it's getting hits on YouTube, so hopefully it's being uh, – for spreading the good word and thank you all for coming out and hope to see you next month. Uh, next month's topic I believe will be five wall systems compared and Josh will tell us about um, new techniques in, in wall systems and maybe touch a little more on the advanced framing that Goldie mentioned. Have a good night. Thanks for coming out in the snow. Mm -hmm.